It's all about the Internet of Things, which, if you're not familiar with that term, it's everything connected to everything else. So this is really a, a data analytics project, and we heard from Simon from Rio Tinto yesterday talking about instantaneous data-driven decision-making. So rather than about a, a, a visual wearable device, this is a wearable device on your wrists to assist that data-driven decision-making, as we call it, live anomaly correction. And uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. So Prem from Swinburne University and myself from All Energy Proprietary Limited Engineering Firm. Um, we're, I'm based up in Brisbane and, and Prem here in Melbourne. So the original objectives from AMPC were understanding key performance indicators and other drivers that govern critical production within a red meat processing plant, identify a major opportunity, so go to the industry and ask what they're interested in doing, then develop a pilot and trial a, an Internet of Things solution. Being engineers, you normally are, are drawn to that bottom one there, the things. So understanding um, a motor speed, maybe a temperature, or trying to have uh, maintenance um, based upon when it needs it, rather than time-driven. However, the Internet of Things is showing that a, a lot more opportunities are in that top three area of data, understanding the process, understanding the people. And as it turned out, this is where the project end, ended up, on that data-driven um, decision-making around processes and people within plants, rather than looking at a piece of rotating equipment. So the pilot that was developed after consultation looked at real-time plant worker actions, in particular soft muscle tissue prevention. So looking for those actions and or guiding to prevent that. Um, computation of metrics, in particular during that onboarding training in the first few months where it's really, really critical to have someone's skills improve and to have that worker working efficiently, reducing the number of cuts that they make in a shift, having, having efficient movement. Um, and finally, knife sharpness was of interest in that rather than a specific knife sharpness uh, measurement device, can we infer knife sharpness via um, lower cost wearable devices? And the answer is yes, and we'll get to that later as well. I'll hand over to Prem now to talk through the, the ecosystem of the, the Internet of Things. Thanks, Garrett. And um, so just sort of going back on the point that Garrett mentioned, um, so I'm, I'm from Swinburne and I'm more the, the technical guy here, but um, I, I've been working in, in this IoT space for just under 10 years now. And I started off working at CSIRO and a sensor at CSIRO back then used to cost $2,000. Uh, today, you can buy them off eBay for $10. So the, the entire spectrum of the hardware has just changed. What hasn't changed a lot is, is the process and the people that are involved in any manufacturing industry. I've had projects uh, right from meat processing all the way to food manufacturing, a whole sort of other areas. And I think our focus has always been not trying to push the technology. It's more around how this can actually enable people, how we can improve processes, how we can improve productivity. Uh, the solution that we looked at, primarily used off-the-shelf devices. So we, we do build sensors, but not unless and otherwise really a necessity. Um, the stuff that you see there is a combination of Raspberry Pis, uh, a waterproof wearable device, which is again a product made by a company in the US that we just bought off the shelf. Uh, the key point is how we can use the data that was integrated or, or we collected from these devices to then start answering a lot of questions that we looked at before. So things like, can I use this data from a worker wearing a, a watch or a wearable device and use this to say, what are the movements that could potentially produce some sort of injuries? Can I use this movement for a training aspect? So there's a lot of immersive uh, discussions going on here. So we are already looking at options where how could we use the data from the best butcher, for example, in order to then train your other employees uh, in a VR environment. But rather than the data is being simulated, you actually take real world data of hand movements of the best butcher, and you can re reproduce that in a VR environment and try train new people to look at saying, that's your movement, that's the speed at which you move your knife. Uh, we also did a bit of a small trial where um, in a more offline setting from the plant, we gave a blunt knife to a, to a butcher, which can't be done in a real plant because of you know, uh, productivity loss. And we validated that, yes, with enough data, we can actually figure out that the knife is quite blunt, the acceleration, the whole sort of metrics that we computed. We, we found out that 
yes, with right intervention, we can actually let a supervisor know. Again, we use AR, VR. Again, I'm not tech, in that space, I'm not recommending a tech product, but we could actually let a supervisor know person worker A, worker B is probably not at its best performance, right? Uh, and the best other big part of this project is, I'll probably go to the next slide, which shows the actual trial that we conducted on, on site. Um, I know it's a bit crude, but, but you know, we've got all these Raspberry Pis wrapped up to make them waterproof, install them in the plant. Uh, these can run on a battery for months together. And, and, and then the watches, for example, can run for days together. And literally, our, our geek stuff sitting in there collecting all this data and doing some real world analysis. But uh, currently, in most of the meat plants, again, I'm sort of I've been working in this project for the last couple of years and I'm learning the industry, is that you, you kind of measure what comes in, what goes out. But there's sort of not much information in, in between, saying which worker worked on which piece of meat, what was the overall yield, what was the throughput, and this information is generally not very well captured. From what we have spoken in consultations, it takes about another week and a half later on to go back and look at all this data and, if at all, come back to saying who did what. What this project gave us was individual worker identification, so we know who worked on what piece of meat and what were they actually doing, what sort of activity they were doing. And at this stage, you're looking at basically, are they just standing idle for a piece of meat to come through? Are they working on aligning their, their knife? Or are they looking at cutting the meat? Or while they're actually performing an activity like cutting, is the knife sharp enough or is it not sharp enough? So all these sort of things could be actually answered. Um, I'll probably quickly cover some of the outcomes that we got from this um, the project. And I actually have a video, but we just thought we're up there at the booth, so I'm more than happy for you to come down and have a chat with us. Um, the results, for this is about a, a snapshot of one hour of data, and the, the pie chart there, uh, the worker on the left um, who was wearing this device, we were able to sort of identify what was the activity the worker was, was performing, right? So a predictive activity, what we call as someone who's working on a piece of meat. Um, the idle, you're just standing like this on the, on the line waiting for meat to come through, or you're actually aligning your knife. And within an hour, the person on the left and the right, the, right, the person on the right is a less experienced worker. And you can see they were working for almost 90% of the time, whereas the worker on the left on the same production line, they were standing next to each other, was almost working only about 70% of the time, right? Uh, but then the one that, what, that we call as active states here, which if you translate into how many pieces of meat someone processed, the experienced worker almost had 50 pieces of meat that they could quickly process through. The inexperienced worker was around 30. I'm on, I'm on the, the outcomes, given its inexperience, we're comparing them with an experienced worker, it's quite obvious. But the most important aspect is the data that now we can capture to inform such sort of decision making, right? In terms of maybe this person requires additional training. He is already on training. Uh, but maybe you could do better ways of training them. Or what are the other things that your line is only as fast as your slowest worker on the line, for example. So can you reorganize your lines when you have multiple production lines to say, these are the best workers? Or you could also start looking at who are my best butchers doing certain type of cuts? And we can answer all those sorts of questions here. And that's what the entire project sort of proved that with the data that we are collecting, we can try and answer all these sort of different questions that we're trying to you know, address and gaps in the industry. So let's look at the dollar signs, cost-benefit analysis. We looked specifically at the opportunity to reduce soft muscle, muscle tissue injury, which is a, um, a main challenge when you are um, resource limited. Um, as you saw, the experienced worker was getting closer to 60% more throughput, but with about a third less effort. And so it's, a, it's some really intriguing data when you start collecting and analysing what the opportunities are around, I heard the term earlier today, not necessarily making every worker the best worker, but in particular helping the people through that onboarding phase and that training phase to achieve an um, acceptable threshold so that they're not going to do themselves an injury via knife sharpness but also via movement. It's quite interesting when you start looking at the data, a blunt knife will start to move outside of an optimal route. So if you think of the perfect XY plane, a blunt knife instantaneously, within seconds, you can see a movement in the third plane or the Z plane, and then greater weight, even from a master butcher, they will change their stance and at how they perform that action. So we, we only confidently put um, benefits 
around two bullet points within this study. That was reduce injuries. So even if you just have an injury uh, savings only, you're at about that 1.1 year payback for a setup. However, when you start looking at this data, the opportunity of increased resource utilisation and a specific example is if you've got boners working at one end, providing the larger pieces of meat to three slicing um, uh, uh, chains or conveyors, they might just through habit provide um, more of the larger pieces to two and not to the third. And you can instantaneously see that a particular line is underutilised or idle or cleaning. So they can, they can be busy in being on the job, that is cleaning, sending fume over to rendering, et cetera, but they're not actually partaking in that productive activity, but rather the, the unproductive activity. So as you increase resource utilisation, so we had about 12% um, increase uh, resource utilisation was calculated from the, from the data during the trial. So that could be improved um, or, or, or if, if, you, if you already have optimal resource utilisation, you're not going to make a gain in that area. However, based on this particular trial, the payback was about 0.4 years only on those top two bullet points. The other big advantages that we didn't put a dollar figure benefit on but can be dragged into projects of this nature are that live anomaly correction, be that if, you're, if you go to pick up something off the ground, that might result in um, contamination. Reduced supervision and reduced supervision movements. When you look at moving around the floor, there's quite a lot of time that a supervisor will put into walking from one end of the floor to another so they can further enhance their utilisation by looking at the data and providing verbal instruction from afar. Reduce training resources, so having more online data at the end of a shift, a trainee receives data and information about how that shift went, and maybe a few pointers. You know, your knife could be a little bit sharper, or you might need a little bit of training in a specific area and not in another. Reduce rework claims. This is a really, really big area for improved efficiency. Um, so cost, 6760 for 40 devices, and that payoff is as little as 0.4 years. And we saw that Gaussian distribution yesterday in the Rio Tinto. So somewhat about rather than everyone doing it that far right, ensuring that people are above an acceptable threshold, especially through that training phase. We already talked about payback. So it was tested in plant with those multiple benefits displayed. Um, we interviewed the experienced and experienced workers and there was no impact on the people at all during their day to day. In fact, they, they forgot about the fact that they were wearing them. Um, and we produce those quantitative and real-time data to make those live anomaly corrections. So, what next? Um, we've done the pilot, so we're looking to take it to the next phase. So looking at uh, utilising it further as a training tool, maybe some machine learning there. So as a stretch target, we think we can get up to 16 different activities. So, um, as I mentioned, you've got addressing the moat, you've got cleaning, you've got sending material to trim, you've got correcting the blade, you've got stretching. Reminding people to stretch is a very, very important one if they haven't stretched in a particular, within a particular time frame. Um, uh, speaking with a supervisor, speaking with a colleague, away from their, their work area. So you, you're 16 different levels of activities to optimise. So there was an example that we mocked up. Uh, obviously full commercial deployment rather than a pilot. And obviously anything repetitive with complex movements, elite sports, biomechanics, injury prevention, rehabilitation are all of interest there. So just very briefly in the last few little minutes in this area of uh, live decision making, one of the other MLA projects that All Energy has been working on is around a renewable energy tool for all parts of the supply chain, um, producer, feedlot and processing. It's free to use, just need to register, anyone's able to use it. Um, and it's pre-loaded with a typical or a medium-sized scenario so that you can see what an opportunity is for a typical plant and then you can go in and change your key parameters. And it's been designed specifically around the key parameters for that business unit, be it number of head, SCU, standard cattle units, or um, hot standard carcass weight. I've got a Q scan. If you want to take a quick photo rather than having to type 
uh, myenergy.tech in, take a photo and, and go to the, to the website there. And we haven't forgotten, has everyone taken a photo that wants to take one quickly? Um, we haven't forgotten about the broiler industry, so we're building one out. I can see people are taking a few more photos with um, AgriFutures for a very similar tool. It's not yet live, but it's been mocked up. It's going through a bit of a soft launch with a select number. So hopefully next month at, um, it'll be farmenergy.tech, there'll be a, a very similar broiler industry tool. And the key metric that we're basing this one in is number of sheds. So if, if you're a producer, you're normally not thinking around specific square meterage or what direction the sheds are facing or, or, or things of that nature, but you'll know off the top of your head the number of sheds. Okay, and that's the time. So uh, feel free to ask us any questions. Thank, Thank you very you. much.